his son Guido is dead, and he immediately goes, goes back down into his tomb. In other words, let's put it in our notes this way. Brilliant, brilliant poetry here. Dante suggesting misreading of events and poetry and important information can lead to all kinds of major issues and problems. Cavalcante misread what was going on. Perceiving my delay and giving me any answer, he fell back flat, face upward, appearing no more. But not so he, the great soul, at whose beckoning I had paused. He did not change his features in any way, nor bend his neck or waist. Two observations. One, Farinata is in fact related to Cavalcante. Guido, the son of Cavalcante, is in fact married to Farinata's daughter. Okay, so they are actually related to each other. And yet notice, number two, Farinata doesn't even pay attention to Cavalcante at all. In other words, as soon as Cavalcante goes back down into the tomb, Farinata goes immediately right back to the conversation that they were having before. And this is what he says at line 70. The point you raised, he resumed, we're interrupted. My kin, not good at learning that art, I feel more agonized by that accursed fact than by this bed. In other words, the fact that the Ghibellines ultimately didn't take over and rule Florence, he says, is the worst imaginable news. But, he says it this way, when the lady's face, the moon, who rules this place has kindled fewer than 50 times, 50 months in other words, he said, then you will know how heavy that art weighs. In other words, in 50 months, you will be exiled. The genius, of course, of this, we will get to here in a bit, but the prophecy by Farinata is, you're going to know what exile is like. Just like I and the Ghibellines learned about exile, you're going to know about exile as well. There's, there's the prophecy of what's coming in the future. Now, tell me, he continues, may you regain the sweet world's vantage. In other words, uh, you know, I hope, I hope you make it out of here. Why is it, why is that people, the Florentines, so fierce in its decrees toward my kin? Why do you Florentine people hate Farinata and my family, the Uberti family, so much? Well, gee, I wonder why, because two times he tried to destroy, completely siding with Siena, tried to destroy the city of Florence, right? And now the answer, and this comes from Dante, the, the poet, as well as the pilgrim. It was the carnage and devastation that dyed the Arbia red, which made the prayers in our temple savage. That is to say, in 1260, at Monteperi, you basically tried to destroy everything that was our home. Are you serious with me? Shaking his head, very not an owl say. I was not alone, he sighed, and surely... I would not have chosen to join the others without some cause, but were all agreed to level Florence, there I was alone, one who defended her before them all. In other words, he says, I think you got this wrong. You've misread it. When we came in and, and conquered Florence, there were people that said, let's just tear the whole thing to the ground, and I was the one that said, no, let's keep Florence alive. I'm a good guy, I'm not a bad guy. Now notice, we have said that everybody in hell is always so narcissistic, everything is about them. Notice, he doesn't even reference Cavalcante and Cavalcante's terrific sadness about his son Guido not being at all a part of the world anymore because supposedly he's dead. Notice here, he says, you should think better of me because I was the one that wanted to save Florence and I did save Florence, which allowed for you to obviously have a home there, right? Of course, that's one reading. There is a second reading that says, well, yeah, but the reason why he wanted to say Florence was so he could take it over and take away a whole bunch of people's possessions, right, and all of that, which, by the way, is the reason why the Uberti family was never allowed back to Florence. Everybody else was allowed back at the end by the Guelphs, except for that Ghibelline family, and this is his question. Ah, uh, pray you, he says, so may your seed find peace again unravel a knot that makes my reason fail. So here we go, end of the canto. Dante's going to ask a question about seeing the future. And he's going to find out something remarkable. These souls in hell, they can see the future, they know the past. The one thing they'll never know is the present. Right? The present. They'll never know what's going on right now up on earth. Which is why Cavalcante didn't know that his son was still alive. 
Dante assumed Cavalcante knows that his son is still alive because he knows the present. Farinata will say, we don't, we don't know the present down here. We know the past, we know the future, we just don't know the present. If I hear rightly, you seem, Dante the Pilgrim says, you seem to foresee what time will bring, and yet you seem to deal differently with the present. And now, Farinata will answer me. Like someone with faulty vision, we can behold remote things well. We know the past. For so much light does he who rules supreme still grant us. In other words, we get just enough, well, obviously light because of the fire, right? But we are foiled when things draw near us and our intelligence is useless when they are present. So of your world in its present state, we have no evidence or knowledge, except if others bring us word, like Dante the Pilgrim. Thus, you can understand that with no sense left to us, all our knowledge will be dead from that moment when the future's door is shut. Thinking about the final judgment, in other words, there will be no sense of the present whatsoever. Now this is an interesting debate that was first started with Aristotle and picked up with us for Aquinas, and it was simply this. You can live in three possible places. The past, no question, your memories. The future, that which is to come. And of course, the present. The thing about the future is that you never actually get there, right? I mean, think about that. When it comes finally the moment of your death, it will not happen in the future. It will only happen in the present, as in now. Of course, the interesting thing about the present is that you never can experience it as the present. Have you noticed this? Every time you experience the present, it's always in some version of either the past or the future. In that regards, we have this interesting idea that those in hell never have any sense of what's going on now. They're lost. You get it now? They're lost in that they never are here. They're always somewhere else. Hmm. Right? He continues. Thus, you can understand that with no sense left to us, all our knowledge will be dead from that moment when the future's door is shut. Then, line 100, uh, 102. Then, moved by compunction for my fault, in other words, I was, uh, it, it, Dante the Pilgrim was, oh, 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 my bad. I didn't answer Cavalcanti about his boy Guido, and I should have done that. I said, will you now tell the one who fell back flat, that is to say Cavalcanti, his son is truly still among the living? Tell him what caused my silence, that my thought had wandered into that error which you're resolving just wiped out or walked away. And now I heard my guy, Virgil calling me back, so hurriedly contriving to learn, I begged the shade to say, if he could, who lay there with him? And I heard him answer, I lie with over a thousand of the dead, the Epicurean, the heretics, right? The second Frederick, the Holy Roman Emperor from 1215 to, to, um, to, to 1250, who is also an Epicurean uh, uh, um, uh, known to be, uh, is among the number. And the Cardinal here, uh, we're talking about the Bishop of, um, of Bologna, uh, Ubelini, um, who was also a Ghibelline sympathizer and also considered to be an Epicurean, didn't believe in, in the soul uh, as surviving the body. Of others, he says, I will not speak. Notice this mantra. I'm not going to tell you everything, right? With that, he hid himself, so Farinata goes away. I walk back over to the ancient poet with my thoughts at work, mulling the words that bore such menace to me. In other words, he's thinking, thinking, thinking about all of this. My guide set out, and as we walked, he spoke. Why is it you're distracted? Or, I'm sorry, disturbed. Why is it you're disturbed? I told him why. He says, preserve in memory what you have heard against yourself. In other words, you better listen to what Farinata was telling you about that whole thing about not returning to Florence. The sage advised. And I pray you listen. Well, now, we're, we're reminded of the great line in the opening, right, of Plato's Republic. How can I hear if, if we refuse to listen, right? Um, he says, you better listen close to what's going on. I mean, think about this. Just put it in your notes this way, and it gives you a sense of it. Dante is sent into exile in 1302, March of 1302, when he is sent away, right? He is, under, under if, if he ever comes back to Florence, he will be jacked, right? 1300 is exactly where we are in the quote-unquote present. In other words, we still have those 50 months before the exile is going to happen. Of course, Dante wrote 
the actual Divine Comedy from 1308 to 1320, finishing in 1320. So notice, we've got those 20 years, those 18 years after 1302 to 1320. You see how that works? So notice here, Dante the Poet is putting Dante the Pilgrim in a poem where Dante the poet is already in exile when he's writing this poem at 1308. Yes, already in exile. And yet, he's saying to Dante the pilgrim, you might want to listen to that whole thing about never coming back. It's a brilliant construction because you get the poet speaking to himself vis-a-vis -vis Dante the pilgrim and saying, you know what? You better listen. You're never coming back. Florence will never be your home again. And of course, this is exactly what happened to Dante, the poet. He finishes, of course, in 1320, and then a year or two, a year, a little over a year later, he dies, right? And, and is buried in Ravenna. Never, never, his body never even makes it back to Florence. He raised the finger at the word listen, right? And now to finish. When you confront her radiance, Beatrice, later in the poem, whose eyes can see everything in their fair clarity, be assured. Then you shall learn. Did you notice? Did you hear it? How many times the word learn comes back in this poem? Then you shall learn what your life's journey will be. In other words, you don't get all the answers now. This is fundamental to reading Dante's poem. You don't get everything now. There are moments in your life where you have to wait for the knowledge that you see. Notice how we began. I really, really want to know. I really want to know. I don't want to ask, I don't want to ask you too many questions and bug you, but I really, really want to know. How Dante comes back, or Virgil comes back and he says, it takes time to be able to get all the answers that you need, right? You get it, but it's going to be at the end when you finish reading all of the Divine Comedy, if you're a reader, when you go through the experience of making it all the way to purgatory, through purgatory and finally to paradisium, right? He turned to the left, and again, we're always going to the left in hell, always going to the right in purgatory. He turned to the left, and leaving the city wall behind our backs, we continued on our way toward the center, which was now our goal. We're, of course, going to the center where Lucifer will be there munching on his three bodies, right? Following a path that strikes the valley floor, and from that valley rose an odor so foul, the stench repelled us even high up there, the wretched stench that is attacking, of course, the old factory. All right, well, that's the conclusion of Canto 10. It's a brilliant canto with so much happening. Let's do some real quick work at level 2 and 3. At 2A, political, one of the major messages. Political strife never ends. Notice it. We're always trying to one-up, one-up, one-up. Farinata tries to one-up Dante the Pilgrim. Dante the Pilgrim one -up, one's up, uh, does a one-up on Farinata, and then Farinata will come back one more time. Of course, Farinata will say it. You're, you're never coming back either. I was exiled. The Ghibellines were exiled. But guess what? You're never coming back to Florence either, right? Of course, another major message here is language and the, mis and the application of language. We might even call it political language, right, as in propaganda. Leads almost always to political strife. Notice in this poem, we have fighting about politics. We have fighting about art as well. Notice as well, this thing about not being able to be a very good listener. Notice at the end of the canto, Virgil says to Dante the Pilgrim, you need to be a good listener. What was it that Cavalcanti did not do? He wasn't a very good listener. He didn't know how to interpret very, very well. And there's great pain often if there is misunderstanding. Of course, <laughs> let's say this out loud, some learning will only come through pain and fear, right? That sounds very much like Plato's Republic, doesn't it? And the reality is that it may have to come through time. There, there's a long distance to be able to get to 18. Think about that. There's a whole lot that has to happen. It's not as if all the stuff you know right now, 18, 19, 20 years old, could somehow have just been given to you in a couple of days. You've got to go through a long journey. Of course, we learned that, didn't we, in our study of Homer's Odyssey as well as Virgil's Aeneid, right? Okay, let's talk symbolism at 2B really quickly. Well, Farinadia is kind of representative of that warrior, that fighter that's never forgiven for the thing that he and his family did. Cavalcante will be symbolic, of course, as a bad listener, somebody who has an inability to completely understand. Of course, he can also be understood as a concerned father or a proud father. He can't believe that um, Dante is allowed to come into the underworld and not his son, who is clearly the better, the better uh, poet. Of course, we kind of laugh at that one because we recognize that as good a, a poet as Guido was, obviously he wasn't the poet that Dante was. The irony at level 2B is that, right, you can't always understand. Cavalcanti, for example, doesn't understand what Dante has said, right? And ironically, 
actually, Guido will soon die. It's kind of fascinating and ironic. Well, let's think about Dante as poet. So, for example, notice, he's borrowing heavily from that scene of Aeneas 6, where Anchises will talk to Aeneas, Anchises, Aeneas' dad, and will give him information, and he will say to him, you need to really hear what I'm about to say. Dante is politician, well, he's figuring it out, isn't he? And we as poets, or we as readers of this poem, also figured out that political schism, it can't be solved by more fighting. Remember our study in Plato, Republic, Plato's Republic of Declension of State. You can't fix conflict with more violent conflict. It doesn't work. But often language gets in the way, politically speaking, of resolution as well. Dante the philosopher? Well, we got some interesting questions. Does the soul really exist? Does the present really ever actually exist? And the ways in which Dante plays with that. At 3 a. Well, think of it, in the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, right, as well as Plato's Phaedo, we have that argument that there is this thing called soul, and it clearly survives the body in the afterlife. Notice Epicurus will argue, yeah, no, there is no such thing as soul, that's a silly idea. You need to live your life now and enjoy the very existence that you have right now, because there is no such thing as a soul that will endure into the afterlife. Go back to our lecture on Phaedo, uh, Plato's Phaedo, that argument for the existence of soul, right? What is your favorite text about afterlife? Another 3A question. What's your favorite text about afterlife and what happens after you die? Lots of interesting debating questions about that one. At 3B, a couple of personal questions now. Do you believe in the idea of a soul that extends and lives beyond the body? Or rather, do you believe that your soul, your consciousness, your spirit, your energy, whatever that is, will not exist after your death? Of course, as we pointed out, if you are in fact energy, and energy is that which can be neither created nor destroyed, then how do you account for death and what death is as it relates specifically to your energy, your consciousness, your soul? Another 3B question, what was the time, like Cavalcante, that you misunderstood what someone was trying to say to you? because you cut them off or you stopped listening halfway through, or it was a misunderstanding of language on some count. Well, there you go. That's Canto 10. We now move on to Canto 11 and circle number 7, the violent, which will be divided into three different rounds. And we move, then notice, from incontinence into uh, the heretics and now it, towards the violent. That is to say, people who did nasties to each other. Technically, of course, you could make the argument, we've been messing around with violence for a while here, right? But we're going to get serious about it now in Circle 7, Canto 11. I hope you'll come back to study. Thank you.